Our first speaker of the day is Dr. Antoinette Quigg, professor as well as the Associate Vice President for Research and Graduate Studies uh, at Texas A&M Galveston, uh, where she has been working since 2003. She received her undergrad and graduate degrees in Australia. Uh, Dr. Quigg has studied the effects of uh, a variety of environmental stressors, natural and man-made, on ecosystems using phytoplankton as indicators on the response. And a little fun fact was that she lived in the U.S. Uh, she's lived in the U.S. since arriving in New Jersey on a very cold, snowy Thanksgiving day in 2000, which they were not aware of when they booked their tickets. So they were not aware how cold it was, and they were not aware that it was on Thanksgiving. Um, so with that note, let's go ahead and start. And Dr. Quigg, um, go ahead and share your screen and get started, please. Thank you first to C. Grant and for the invitation to present today. Very excited to share some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and um, today I'm just going to give you guys a, a gentle introduction into marine snow and uh, who makes the snow and where it comes from and why it's important. Um, some of this work was uh, funded by the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative as part of a program called Adamex. And um, much of the work that I'm showing you today is uh, from the literature um, from the last 50 or 60 years of, of studies on marine snow itself. Starting with um, the beginning, um, which is the biological carbon pump. Um, this is the arguably the most um, important process on the planet and um, it's responsible for the air we breathe. Um, this process has been going on for um, millions of years and um, it, it starts with uh, the plankton. Um, they are the photosynthesizers in the ocean, uh, drawing down CO2, growing um, and uh, producing uh, life as we know it in the form of photosynthesis. Um, and convert and in essence um, sequestering that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and ultimately sending it to the seafloor as you can see in this figure here. Uh, phytoplankton are eaten by the zooplankton um, and often these are eaten by uh, fish and in this way um, the organic material moves through the food web um, from the, from the smallest microbes to the largest um, organisms in our oceans. And uh, when uh, either phytoplankton or zooplankton and other creatures um, die, they release that organic carbon back into the ocean. Um, also, when they produce fecal matter, they're essentially releasing that carbon back into the ocean as well. Somehow, some way, um, this material finds itself and will aggregate. Um, and as it aggregates, it becomes larger and forms visible um, masses, which we call marine snow. Um, and this marine snow, as it becomes larger and denser, um, sinks through the water column. Um, and as it does so, um, it buries the, the carbon associated with it. Um, these um, masses of organic material are hotspots also for bacterial activity and that's important because that activity um, breaks down um, the fecal matter and the marine snow and releases much of it back into the ocean again where it can be reused. And so this biological carbon pump that you can see in this diagram here um, shows how it's a circular process starting from the surface to the sediments and then back again. Um, as I said earlier, this process has been going on for millions of years and it's how carbon um, is buried in the deep ocean. And um, the petrol and, or gas that we put in our vehicles um, originally started um, as a result of this process many, many millions of years ago. So let's see. Um, okay, sorry. Give me a second. Um, having technical issues. There we go. Oh. Now, this is one of my favorite diagrams because it shows these microbial organisms releasing um, 
what we call exopolymers. And exopolymers are essentially lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. And this material is very, very sticky. And as you might imagine, um, when it interacts with particles and other organisms in the water column, um, they will come together and um, aggregate and um, form that marine snow that we can see. That we can see. Uh, why do these um, creatures produce these um, exopolymers? Um, that's a great question and something that we've wondered for a very long time. Uh, one of the main ideas, one of the main tenets is that um, they're releasing this material um, to protect themselves. So the simplest analogy I can give you is when you get a cold or the flu, you also produce a mucus-like um, material, which we call an exopolymer. And that's effectively helping to protect yourself from, from, the, um, from the aerosols in the air and things like that that um, um, happen when you have allergies or when you have a flu and things like that. So protection is thought to be um, one of the primary reasons that they release this material. Uh, they are also very good at producing biofilms and um, biofilms are found um, all over the ocean. I think most folks would be f uh, familiar with biofouling that happens on boats and in piers. Um, those, th that happens as a re result of these biofilms being formed and it essentially allows them to attach to each other um, in, in various ways. So um, when, when did we start looking at marine snow? When did we start thinking about marine snow and trying to understand it? Um, the earliest records actually go back to the 1800s um, where people were wondering how fish and other um, creatures that live in the deep ocean um, get their food and um, what, the, what kind of food they were getting in the deep ocean. Um, it wasn't really until the 1950s um, that the first publication, um, which actually is uh, the sketch that you can see in this figure here, um, showing you a marine snow that was collected su successfully without um, breaking it. Um, marine snow is very, very de delicate and um, is often difficult to measure because it, it breaks so easily. But what you can see is um, different kinds of phytoplankton and zooplankton trapped in a uh, matrix of um, exopolymers. Um, and um, in, in the last two or three decades, uh, with changes in improvements in technology, we've been able to look at it much more carefully and much work has gone into um, studying it um, down to the molecular level. Um, and so if you look at it um, under the microscope, you can see that it's like a big spider's web um, in some cases. And um, that's probably how the different microbes get trapped in this microbial material. Um, we've also used a lot of uh, different kinds of staining techniques to um, see what is being trapped in the material as well as the nature of the material itself and um, carbohydrates are an important component of this marine snow um, which makes sense from the point of view that they're inexpensive and so a cell can probably release quite a lot of them without um, having um, also harm themselves by releasing this material and that fits in with the idea that they're protective uh, some of the biggest marine snow recorded was actually that associated with um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And that's the image that you see there on your right. And this was centimeters long um, and centimeters wide. So it was, it was um, definitely very large. And um, in, the, in the next few slides, I will um, show you why we think that um, such large uh, marine snow was able to be formed. Um, just a minute to talk about the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, um, which occurred in 2010 and killed 11 people. Um, at that time, it was the largest spill in US history. 
um, discharging more than 4.9 million barrels of oil um, and for the for the first time using um, almost 2 million um, gallons of uh, oil dispersants um, to break up the oil both in the surface as well as uh, in the deep water. And I show you um, this image of a turtle because um, immediately um, after the spill, um, folks were really worried about um, what I like to call the charismatic megafauna. So turtles, um, dolphins, whales, birds, um, all the large marine mammals and um, fish that may have been um, impacted as well as turtles and, pl and plants. Um, but I was more interested in what was going on with the plankton. And so um, uh, that the plankton definitely don't make the news press, but they are certainly very, very important. So, um, so, so what was going on with the, the plankton and what was um, going on in terms of marine snow formation? Um, this is a nice little slide because it, it summarizes um, the major ways that we know that marine snow um, formed as a result of the Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, and it also distinguishes um, marine snow formation um, from oil mineral aggregates which are also known to occur um, in, the, in the event of an oil spill. So if we start over at the left, um, the, the way that we normally think about marine snow forming is, is what I talked about with the first slide um, as part of the, the um, biological carbon pump um, where snow is formed near the surface and it gets transported um, into deeper waters. And if you go to the second box, you'll see that um, the other way that marine oil snow was formed um, was uh, through the fecal pellets um, of zooplankton. And that was, again, something that we know naturally occurs, but with the presence of oil um, that, that may have been accelerated, um, maybe not. And, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a definitely a number of different ways in which um, the marine snow can be formed. And in the last decade, a lot of energy and effort has been um, dedicated towards understanding each of these processes and the, its importance. Sorry. Um, when you consider um, the formation of marine oil snow, and its sedimentation um, to the seafloor um, and the processes in between. Um, the acronym MOSFA was, um, was used to summarize these. So MOSFA is marine oil snow sedimentation and flocculate accumulation. And really this is, um, MOS MOSFA and our understanding of MOSFA is really an attempt to understand the many different um, individual reactions and processes going on um, that lead to um, the accumulation of this material. And um, you may ask, why do we care? And um, depending on which report you read, um, the MOSPA pathway um, is thought to have accounted for somewhere between five and 31% of the total oil returning back to the seafloor. And um, that's uh, significant when you think of this being a biological and natural process. And when you consider that um, a lot of the um, man-made um, human type uh, approaches to remediating the oil um, in many cases were, were less efficient. So um, mother nature um, if left to her own devices, is actually pretty creative and um, very good about um, cleaning up our messes. At least that's how I interpret this. Um, so so MOSFER um, in the Gulf of Mexico was, was rather special. And um, there were a number of um, things that um, scientists feel were important in um, driving the formation of um, this event. One of those was the uh, large and extensive drainage of the Mississippi River 
And in this slide, you can see what it looks like when you're out in the Gulf of Mexico and the brown Mississippi River water hits the blue Gulf of Mexico water. And um, you might see this little bitty boat um, at that um, transition zone, um, just to show you how significant that river discharge is. That discharge brings with it a lot of nutrients, which fuel phytoplankton um, and very important for primary productivity. It also brings in a lot of suspended particles and those are, um, those are important in terms of moss for formation because they act as a kind of um, uh, a surface area where the marine snow material glues onto and eventually um, helps with sinking. Um, we should also remember that with all that primary productivity, there was um, likely enhanced um, zooplankton grazing, which released more fecal pellets, which I'm sure um, also led to more marine snow being formed. Um, here are some um, zooplankton. I would say for them, it was like an all-you-can-eat buffet. And um, here was just some close-ups of, of the marine snow material um, and in the slide that I just, in the picture I just sh showing you, you can see how the oil droplets uh, are getting trapped um, and sticking to that um, marine snow material um, so that it eventually sediments out. Um, again, you know, the why do we care question, I think part of it is because we're concerned that this is a route for hydrocarbons to move through uh, the food web. Uh, and the other reason that we're concerned about it is because uh, once this material does hit the seafloor, um, on its way down, um, different kinds of fish, both economically and recreationally important fish, um, are going to be impacted, as well as all the benthic creatures um, that we know exist on the seafloor. Uh, one of the questions that we get a lot is, has this happened before? Um, and after an extensive literature search, it was um, determined that yes, um, it has happened before, um, back in the early um, 1970s with um, several oil spills. Um, but the Deepwater Horizon um, incident is, I, I would say, where it's been most well documented and most effort has gone into um, understanding it. Um, this is a bit of a chaotic slide, um, but it, it's, it's an effort to um, summarize, I guess, the last um, decade of work um, by some folks to understand what are the drivers of marine oil snow uh, formation with a particular emphasis on looking at the biology and the chemistry. And if you look at the um, triangle in the middle, um, it shows you the, what, what um, is thought to be the major driving factors um, for marine oil snow formation. And if you have these um, critical elements, um, riverine influence, marine biota, oil and dispersants, um, it technically increases the likelihood that you're going to see marine snow formation um, in, in, a, in the various um, simplest form. And what I show you on the um, right hand side is trying to understand how you go from proteins and carbohydrates, um, which are very simple molecules, um, to marine snow, uh, which is on the top right hand corner. Um, that is still an active area of research and um, it, it's important for not just understanding how marine snow forms, but um, what are the consequences um, of this formation um, to the rest of the food web and to the, to the health of the ocean. And then what I'm showing you on the left-hand side is um, some um, effort towards understanding on a, a more macroscopic level. So the right is a microscopic level, the left is on a macroscopic level. Uh, so the little blue and orange dots are images of, you know, bacteria and um, oil coming together. And then the nice schematic um, at the bottom is an effort to show you how under different circumstances 
in the presence and absence of dispersant, um, marine snow might come together. And if anyone's interested in the details, let me know and I will send you, send you the papers quite happily. Um, I just wanted to say that um, it takes a village to do this work. Um, this is my little village. Um, we have in this um, uh, photo, um, a 15 year old high school student to a now 88 year old senior scientist. And so um, with this slide, I wanted to say thanks for listening to me and um, you're never too young or never too old to um, learn about marine snow formation or to do science. So thank you.